excited to be here. As he mentioned, um, I am not a pastor, I'm not a preacher, I'm not sure I'm even a teacher. Um, if I had to self-identify, I would say I'm a social entrepreneur, someone who cares deeply about both people and place. And so my hope today is just to share a little bit about my story, the story of the community that I'm from, as well as share a little bit about some of the global trends happening and what that might mean for each of us in our communities. I wanna start by sharing a story and then kind of proposing a question. Probably 10 years ago, a mentor of mine asked me this question. He said, who is the prophets? Who are the prophets in your city? Who's speaking truth? Not just in terms of sharing the truth of the gospel, but who's speaking truth to power? Who's reimagining your city? Unfortunately, I didn't have a great answer for that. And he said, well, let me, let me rephrase it. Maybe, are there any poets? Any poets who are creatively responding to the need in your community who you can think of? I think a couple poets or spoken word artists popped up in my mind who were speaking truth to young people and to systems and power structures. But they still were somehow suppressed in my context. There hadn't really been provided great space for the prophets or the poets. A couple years later, this friend of mine invited me to Guatemala City. And I had been to Honduras and other places in Central America. But this is really a pivotal time for me where I began to think differently about what the role of a prophet or a poet is in a particular place. And so all I knew about Guatemala City is what I read, that there were over 430 gangs who had been armed by the kind of post-Civil War, all the weaponry kind of went into the communities. I knew that only over 75% of the population, or at least the, the, the children under 18, had been impoverished. I knew that there was lots of corruption. So I got to the airport, I'm waiting for him. I'm a little disoriented in my own kind of American privilege. I'm thinking, I just wanna go home and take a nap and you know, go to the conference that we were gonna go to. He gets in the car, we start driving downtown. He rolls down the window, a big semi truck comes and blows a bunch of smog out. He kind of waits for it to pass. He rolls the window down, he takes a deep breath and he goes, I love this city. I thought, wow, I don't think there's anyone that I'd ever spoken to or known that was able to speak about a place with such a conviction. He had been a missionary there for almost 15 years and it was certain for me that he wasn't just loving this place paternalistically. It wasn't that he felt bad for this place. And it surely wasn't like he was just loving all of the stuff that this city had to offer, which far too often in my own context, which recently we were named Beer City USA, or at least that was last year for Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I hear a lot of people saying, oh, I love our city. Well, you love consuming what our city has to offer. So I propose this question for us. What does it mean to love a city and seek both its peace and its prosperity. For me growing up as a poor brown kid, I don't even know if I liked my city, let alone love it. And so this began the journey for me of beginning to understand what true love for people and place are all about. And if we look at scripture, we know that Jesus himself wept two times one over the dead body of Lazarus, and two over the condition of the city of Jerusalem. The biblical story shares that we too ought to love both people and the places in which they reside. And so our city had to begin wrestling with this. In many ways, the church, the Christian church in Grand Rapids, Michigan, was indicted after a series of community meetings that happened in 2006. And so in 2006, there were 31 shootings in our community. There was 
12 homicides, nine of those homicides happened in the southeast side of Grand Rapids in the Baxter community where I had previously been born and raised. Nine of these homicides were primarily brown and black men and so the community said we have to do something. So faith leaders, business leaders, civic leaders all gathered over a series of conferences. We broke up in different sections and we finally issued a report to the broader community. We called it the Community Forum to End Violence and they made three critical statements about the systemic and neighborhood issues we were facing. One is there was a lack of accessible employment and business participation in central city neighborhoods as it related to hiring young people of color. Two was there was clearly missing some structural, collaborative, and cross-sectoral collaboration in regards to business, church, and nonprofits. And three, and here it is, there was a visible lack of church and religious leaders not actively engaging and addressing the needs and concerns of their communities. Especially, they added, as it related to demonstrating their Christian values in the community. See, what's interesting about the city of Grand Rapids, Michigan, is that it actually consistently is ranked one of the most philanthropic communities in the country by Forbes and other places, always top five, never less than top 10. That's because there's a thousand millionaires, there's five billionaires, many major Christian publishing companies, so Zondervan, Erdman, Baker, to name a few, there's seven Christian seminaries. It's been rated the best place to buy property or real estate recently, best places to raise kids, some of the best schools, best places to retire. So how in the world are we coming to grips with all of this terrible things happening in this community? Well, the research actually gets worse. Now we know about our city of Grand Rapids that actually it has some of the worst poverty in the country. That in the neighborhood I work in, in the 49507 district, the lead levels in children is actually higher than in Flint, Michigan, which was a global crisis because of the polluted water. But it's not because of water in Grand Rapids, it's because of lead-based paint. And it's been this way for over a decade. Recently in 2014, Forbes did research on 52 metropolitan areas. They found Grand Rapids to be the second worst city for African Americans to live in relation to median income, home ownership, and business ownership. If there was a place in the country, a city in the country that we might be able to look at and say, wow, with all of these churches, over 900 churches, 2,800 nonprofits, if there was a place where there was massive wealth, lots of Christian thought and publishing and the best research, Clearly, it should be a place for all people to thrive. But in fact, I say it's been more so a great place to survive for many people of color, but not a place to thrive. And I think that's because our model is broken. We've been stuck in this model as a church and as believers and as a charitable city in which it's the soup kitchen model. It's we have resources and we see those poor people and so we'll go and give them some of our resource. But what it allows us to do is continue to stand in our own superiority and reaffirm them, the other, the poor, and their inferiority. Because we don't have to engage in relationship, we don't have to be present in the brokenness. I think we have to move to a potluck model where everyone is provided the opportunity to work for themselves and earn an income and bring something to the table. See, in my community, I'm actually frustrated. I actually don't think that people are poor. People have been impoverished. And that's because there are systems, there are institutions, there are policies and practices that create these type of outcomes. Unfortunately, the church has been in bed many times with the religious, the religious institution in bed with the economic systems, afraid to speak prophetically to those realities because those realities continue to benefit our insular church. We love to give money and create new programs. We love to give money away, but not fully getting to the issues that have created this. I think this is an issue that all communities really have to face. And that's because we're now living in a new urban reality. The new urban reality is that in 1910, less than 5% of the world lived in urban centers. Today, 
more than 50% live in metropolitan areas. In the next 32 years, there'll be an increase of 2.5 billion people, and that will be absorbed 100% by cities across the world. So what does that mean for us as believers? How are we going to be relevant and speak to these challenges? Because the reality is, is that the folks moving to these cities, especially in the US, are refugees, they're immigrants. They're black and brown people. What are our suburban churches going to do about this? Is this a problem to solve or is this an opportunity to celebrate? The diversity of the potential New Jerusalem coming to pass where every nation and every tribe and every tongue will be together with our Savior. Well, a couple of leaders began to dream about this a little bit more intensively. Intentionally, we brought on a church, a nonprofit, a global nonprofit, Bethany Christian Services. And then we went to the other stream and we added the NAACP. Folks who we say are like us, not like us, even inviting people to the table who don't like us. And we started having these conversations about what would it look like in this context that is extremely racially divided and economically divided to be co-located in this neighborhood, in one of the worst neighborhoods in the city and retain our own organizational structures, but have one mission and one vision, a vision to see radically impressive transformed communities. And so we started what we call the Grand Rapids Center for Community Transformation. By no means is this an answer, but we think it's a pilot. It's forging new places. It's creating new energy in the city, new dialogue. So since then, we've started two, as Tom mentioned, two social enterprises, We now have employed over 35 people in the community. We share 10% of our profits. The other 90% goes back into scaling the businesses. We measure people, planet, profit, and purpose and issue an annual impact report. We measure our carbon footprint and then our offsets by our tree planting. We see a reduction. We serve about 400 low-income youth. We've seen a reduction by 50% in trauma. We've created new housing develops with community developers in which we've created the first model in Michigan that's housing youth who've aged out of foster care who pay 30% of their rent or 30% of their income for rent um, and they're co-located with folks who are paying market rent. Part of this though is getting to this place is not easy. This is 10, 11 years of very hard and difficult work. One of the questions in Folks that I love is uh, Franciscan priest Richard Rohr says, cities transmit the wounds that they don't transform. Part of this work has been being in the city, in the context and letting the pain of the city sit with us long enough that it transforms us. Because unfortunately, I think we've been transmitting our wounds for a long time. The church hasn't been dealing with their own sickness We don't address the fact that marriages are falling apart, that men are addicted to pornography, that one in six women have been sexually abused in the church. We're not addressing those issues. We're not talking about those real issues. So we'll start a new program. We'll start a new nonprofit to go help those poor people. But until we have been transformed ourselves, until we have been begin to take the pain of the community and absorb it and transform it into something beautiful, I think we continue to be stuck in the same place. So that's what it means to be a prophetic entrepreneur, someone who's willing to speak truth to power, even if it means they get killed, even if it means they get ostracized. An entrepreneur is someone who's willing to take risks or what they say, this idea of creative knowing, who's looking at the global trends, someone who's looking at the marketplace and seeing not just a market opportunity to make money, but also one to make social impact. And so as I've been thinking about the future of both the church as well as our community, um, it's really important for us to reimagine our city, that it's not just this fixed system that we can't influence, it's an organism that we can inject new life, new innovation, new ways of thinking. We can try and we can fail fast. The reality is, is that if you look at the biblical narrative, both in Genesis and Revelation, there is no church. There is no temple. In both the ideal created state and in the 
future state, there is just God, his people, and justice. So my questions to all of you, what are we doing to prophetically reimagine our cities? Are we willing to take risk in our cities? See, the good news is, is I actually do believe that cities are healed relationally. I believe that over time, places just like people will begin to bear the mark of the ones who love it. But that means addressing our own issues, our own stuff. It means not just understanding the hope of a place or just understanding the hurt of the place, but it's understanding both the hurt and the hope. Thank you. Thank you.